Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I'm excited to be here with Josh Simons. He is the founder of Vamper, which we'll tell you about in a minute. But before that, he was a musician who toured for about 10 years. He actually opened up for people like Keith Urban and Carrie Underwood uh, with his band. So he has a lot of cred as far as being in the trenches as a musician and now creating something to help other musicians. So we have a lot in common in that way. So I'm looking forward to hearing a little more about his story and how he got to where he is now and how what he has created with Vamper is here to help you guys as musicians. So uh, before we get into all of that, I'd love to hear Josh, just a little of of your background, how you got started as a musician and what um, led you to to doing what you are today. Well, first of all, thank you for having me and what a hell of an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Very well written. Um, yeah, so as you as you sort of said, I, I well, these days I run Vampa, which is a tool that helps musicians find other musicians and music industry people to connect with. But um, getting to that point was quite a journey and, and obviously wanting to start a company like that um, comes from a place of a kind of like you said, going through the trenches and navigating the world of being a young musician, which is tricky to put it mildly. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, for me, it started. I mean, we could go right back to being a, a child, but it's probably more, it gets more exciting around the age of 20. So I might, I might skip the childhood years, but <laughs> sort of was played music most of my life as a lot of musicians have. Um, but then, yeah, when, when I was about 20, I was managing a couple of bands, um, just friends, sort of friends of friends, people, you know, that you sort of, you meet bands and you sort of like what they're doing. And I thought I could maybe help them get out there. And those bands didn't really have the drive to be commercially successful. And that kind of got to me and I thought, well, I can sing and I can play. So maybe I should start my own thing. Um, and then I started a band, which is called Buchanan. And, uh, it kind of blew up in Australia within about six months of, you know, starting it to, you know, we had a song on the radio six months later, um, <clears throat> which is unusual. That is not the normal um, path, but uh, still not an easy uh, process from there. And, and But we did nevertheless enjoy a sort of five or 10 year run after that point um, of, you know, playing clubs and then, you know, bigger venues and then 1000 people rooms. And then ultimately, like you said, we supported Carry um, Underwood and Keith Urban on a on a national tour, uh, which was really exciting. Played to about one hundred and fifty thousand people over eight nights or something. That was, that was the last big tour that we did. Um, around that time was when I started Vamper actually, and so when I got off stage the final night of that tour, I thought I actually had a bit of a teary moment, and I thought that might be the last show I ever do because Vamp is starting to get quite serious, and we've got lots of shareholders, and we've raised lots of money. Uh, anyway, about a year before we did that tour. I was having a really hard time replicating the success of Buchanan outside of Australia in any other market. Um, And it became really obvious to me that the the challenge wasn't sort of talent or ambition or anything like that. It was uh, a lack of a network and knowing who to turn to, how to build a team in a market that's foreign to you, that you don't understand. Um, You think about, like I can only talk on my own experience, but it took me five years to understand who are the best radio pluggers in Australia, who are the best publicists, who are the best managers, who are the best agents. You then, you know, land in another place. Like in my case, we, I went to England and, and I didn't know any of those people. And I thought, I don't have another five years of my life to learn another market, right? And so that's where Vampa came along. And I thought technology has to be able to solve this problem so that something that can take five years can be done in five minutes or five seconds even. Um, and... So I started Vampa at that point and that was 2015. And then it was kind of like, I wouldn't call it a side project, 
but I managed to split that with still being in a successful Australian band for a, a while until I had to make a decision. And, and that's kind of where, where I am today. So now, now I'm just the full-time CEO of Vampa, the former artist Buchanan. Wow. So what year was that when you started Vampa? Yeah, so we started Vampa in 2015, but we didn't really start like hitting the ground and pushing it really aggressively until about 2017. Okay. And so what is the kind of the premise or the mission behind Vamper? Like I get that it's networking, but more specifically. Well, I guess think go back a step. The idea of networking in general is quite laborious, tedious, if not nerve wracking to most people on the planet, even extroverts. Um, putting yourself out there and meeting strangers is not very fun. Um, and so you then add arts into the mix, which is an expressive thing, and it, they're almost incompatible. And so we thought, how do, how do we solve that? And we decided to come up with a, a way of networking that's in, in the tech world, you'd call it gamification. Um, mm -hmm. The layman, you'd call it swipe technology. And so we thought, you know, instead of people looking through resumes and having to fill out forms and post job listings of what they're looking for and scan people, why not make it audio visual? Why not make it dynamic? Why not make it instant? Something that you can swipe through. Like, I like that. I don't like that. I do like this. I don't like that. Um, and make it modern. And, and so there was nothing like that on the market at the time. Um, there's certainly a lot of coffee cats out there now. Um, <laughs> But when we when we first came out with came up with the idea, there was literally nothing even close to it. And I would say that the last time the internet had a solution to help musicians network effectively was probably MySpace in the mm. early days, um, before it became something else and <laughs> ultimately faded into obscurity. But nothing had filled that void, and that void was always a huge opportunity, I think, for someone to come along and sort of you know, claim that land. Um, and certainly musicians needed it. So, you know, to answer your question, you know, what, is, what is it beyond just networking? Hopefully it's a place where you can find relationships that stay with you for, you know, the duration of your musical career or more broadly your life. Plenty of people on Vampire have gone on to get married and started mm. businesses together and, you know, lease properties together and studios together and things like that. Um, so it's it's ultimately a place to build relationships. Even though we are going to be introducing transactional tools like um, we'll, we'll call it marketplace sometime in the near future where people can sell services, we actually purposely didn't start there because that's what Fiverr kind of is, um, where you can go on and pay for a service. We purposely wanted to start and establish that our brand was about building relationships and that, that, that anything can stem from, from that uh, if, when you get that right, basically. Um, as a, one of our one of our many catchphrases, but it all starts with a connection, and I really fundamentally believe that to be true for all aspects of life. Yeah, I completely agree. I would say relationships are one of the main ways that I've built my business to where I have now. You know, and as a musician, when I was a musician, so I completely agree with that. I am curious though, like, why not just find the corner of LinkedIn that is music people? It's not. Um saturated to the degree that it should be so if you look at the creative arts as a percentage of jobs in the entire workforce across the world it's about 10 percent mm. and that's not musicians that's the arts more broadly which fam speaks to these days but if you look at that as a percentage on linkedin it's only four percent so what does that sort of mean it, it it tends to suggest that you know people in the arts uh, aren't finding usefulness in linkedin and as as a creative and a musician I certainly never was able to find a good contact in LinkedIn. I mean, I think back to those London days that I was describing before when I was looking for a plugger and a manager in London. And um, I definitely remember sitting in a lonely, cold London apartment searching for <laughs> those things on LinkedIn. And even though some people came up, it's, it's a very cold sort of web 1.0 scroll, send a, you know, a message, maybe they'll get back to you, maybe they won't. It's just a fundamentally different approach to the the way that Vampa is tailor made for um, creators and musicians. And so, uh, yes, you could absolutely go on LinkedIn. You could also go stand at the back of your nearest, you know, coolest music bar and, and hope to meet someone that way too. The, the point of Vampa is really to be the most efficient place to do it. Got it. 
So, and I love that it's is for musicians because it is true that I do feel like LinkedIn is a little bit of a ghost town when it comes to, to artist yeah. stuff. So is this- I, more- I would just also say, sorry, not to cut you off, I, but I should make the point. You can't go on LinkedIn and say, show me uh, a guitarist in Connecticut who likes Pink Floyd and Tyler, the creator, whereas you can do that on BAM. Probably the easiest, I should have just said that because that's like 10 times quicker, but um, <laughs> that's the, the fundamental difference. That um, does drive the point home for sure. Yeah, like yes. the ability to search for very specific things and genres and, and yes. like you said, like, like artists and that kind of thing. So what actually are the connections that you would be making? I, I think for me, I'm still trying to figure out like, is this for people that are trying to like work in the music industry? Is it for people who want to find people to help them in their career, like managers and things? Or is it like for musicians that need players? Like, is it for all of those things? Okay. <laughs> so there's, it went, oh, but it's a good question. And, um, uh, you know, if you'll indulge me, I'll explain how we got to where yeah. it is today. So when we started, it was really just find my band. It was like guitarists, bass players, drummers, singers, producers, maybe managers. It was like basically the small little team. And it was good. We had to start small because if you start with a thousand categories, they're all going to have only one person in each one and it's going to be a ghost town. So we, we had to create scarcity in some, restra- in some respects and we had to put restraints on um, how big the thing could be, um, which is a clever way to actually grow something. But anyway, so we started with just the band. Um, and then over time, we would add categories and we would add categories based on demand. So people would send us an email and say, hey, why isn't there string players or why isn't there oboists? Or, and, and when we'd get enough emails, eventually we'd say, OK, there's enough people now that we can justify adding another category. Then that became unscalable. And so we decided let's there's enough people in BAMP now to let's let people add their own categories. And as soon as we did that, we went from having 57 categories to now 27,000 different jobs. <laughs> so that, uh, that's how many different job types technically exist on BAMP. Although when you're searching, you can't s- search specifically for like any of those 27,000. We, we use clever technology to bring them into related fields and we let you search for more broader areas like management or a and um, publicity, promotions. You can search anything you like, but you can't search for some of those obscure ones that people put in there. Got it. Yeah. Now, if you're using this to find people to help you in your career, is there any kind of like rating system or, you know, like Thumbtack or Yelp or something like that, that helps, you know, like these people are legit. They've, I've, these people have had great experiences with them and these people we don't necessarily know. Yeah. So we try to do that work um, algorithmically for you. So typically speaking, you won't see people for any number of reasons that we don't really disclose publicly, but we we know that they're either not necessarily fraudulent, but maybe not taking it too seriously or taking the piss a little bit, um, mm-hmm. or they haven't bothered filling out their profile properly um, and they're abusing the system and they're trying to connect with everyone. We'll hide them and demote them in the algorithm. Yeah, let's be honest. There are the spammers out there. There are yeah. the people that are going to try to take advantage of artists. Yeah. And we, we've dealt with it since day one. And as our as we become more sophisticated, they catch up um, and it's a, it's a never ending game. Um, it's a cat and mouse game for you guys. It is. It is. And it's, it's a, scamming is a, is a weird thing. Cause I remember when I was an artist, there would be times when I would, I can think when I had a Reverb Nation account and someone would, you'd get you know messages from other bands, like check out my new single. And I used to doubt myself and go, I wish I had that hustle, but it's not hustle when you're just copying and pasting and annoying people. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't think it's an effective way to, to scale your personal business because um, there's no care or personalization involved. And we, we try and do a lot of educational blog pieces on our website, encouraging people that like, you know, or, or rather in, in highlighting to them the value of personalization and, and tailoring a message to really, you know, connect with someone in a meaningful way uh, and not do the copy paste thing. But anyway, so we, yeah, we use technology to, 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 to do that. One thing that we are thinking about releasing this year, although I, I doubt it will be in the first half of the year, is a recommendation system similar to what LinkedIn calls endorsements so that you could scroll to some the bottom of someone's profile and just see you know, how many other people have either connected with them mm. on the app and, and said this person is legit. But there's other ways that you can tell on Vampa whether someone takes themselves seriously. For example, we have a, a, a tier called Vampa Pro, which is our subscription tier. 
and people who are on pro get the pro badge. So immediately when you're swiping through, if you see someone with the pro badge, you know that they're taking their career seriously because they're investing in themselves. They're spending money um, backing themselves, backing their vision, backing their networking ability. So th there's little things like that. Um, there's a few other little bits and pieces that are telltale signs that someone's probably that next caliber above. And certainly from an algorithm perspective, we'll be doing a hell of a lot more this year on um, working out skill levels based on, um, well, I, I can't actually get into exactly how we're going to be doing it because that would not be fair to my team. But, um, but we are going to be doing work so that when you log on, you're seeing people at a similar skill level immediately. There is always a segment of our audience that says, why can't you let me set my skill level? So people want to be able to say, I'm a semi-pro or I'm a pro or I'm an amateur or um, you know, just getting started or a hobbyist. Uh, the problem is, is that most people, when we've tried this in the past, set their setting to semi-pro. And of mm -hmm. course, what you think is semi-pro and what I think is semi-pro are probably two right. different things. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't work when you sometimes give people all of the control. And so that's one of the hard parts of my job, although I'm not complaining, um, is making some decisions for the users uh, for their benefit. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so you started to answer a question that I was about to have was that okay. how you pay, how you bring in money with this app, right? Like I, I'm assuming that there are people can join for free, but then there's those pro badges that you can pay to help support the site. Yeah, that's right. And the pro badge, it's, it's a whole bundle of features. So it's the, we call it the Vampa pro bundle because you get nine or 10 additional sort of value adds that you don't get on the freemium account, the free account has 80% functionality. So it's very much, we built it for people to use. Like we, we're not, we don't try, we don't like get you in the door and then immediately say, you have to sign up to pro. It's, um, it's about 3% of our audience who are pro members, uh, which is exactly the sweet spot that we want it to be. It, it also helps us with an a &R, from an A&R standpoint, knowing who the people are that are gonna back themselves. And so, yeah, we, we, we're quite happy with how pro works. Pro is for people who wanna be able to connect with more folks, for people who wanna be able to upload more tracks, who want more profile pictures, who want who want to keep more of their royalties if they're using Vampa distribution, because we, we offer a distribution service. Um, so free members keep 80% of their royalties, where pro members keep 100% of their royalties. Um, and it's $4 a month. So it's, it's really not a lot of money uh, to, to most folks. That's Vampa Pro in a nutshell. Wow, that is really low priced, including yes. distribution services. That's crazy. It's one of the cheapest distribution. I mean, there are there's a couple of completely free distribution options, but they always take a massive commission. We are probably the most, from a pricing perspective, competitive distribution service in the world. Um, we're also one of the newest. And um, we're not trying to own that space. Frankly, music distribution companies are a race to the bottom. <laughs> so many of them um it's it's kind of we treat it more at this stage as a bit of a loss leader to be honest it's a, a way to get other people interested and into the door and then hopefully realizing wow this is a fan, fantastic place to network we always view the network as the core of our business and everything else is hopefully value adds that we bring to our customers and in turn will earn us some you know income but it's a very reciprocal relationship like that well, that makes sense so as far as like who's really active and like pro on the platform? Is it mostly people that are offering services that are pro or are there plenty of musicians that do the pro option? Uh, that's a great question. It's actually a very healthy split. Although, you know, if you would have asked me a year ago, just as we were launching, I would have guessed it would have been more people looking to sell their services because it, it makes sense, right? They, mm -hmm. they want the lead gen tools. Um, no, it's a healthy split. But I think the people who are retaining and, and signing up again and again and renewing their subscription month after month, that's definitely skews more towards the people in the professional services side, like your graphic designers and your, your publicists and people like that. But no, there's definitely lots of musicians. I think musicians use Pro for a short amount of time while they need it and then they switch it off, whereas the people in the services side of the industry just let, it, let their subscription kind of knock on. Right. Um, so as far as musicians networking, I mean, obviously they can come there and they can find people that are going to help them in their career, but I'm assuming a lot of it also is how they can meet other musicians and they might be able to do gig swaps or, you know, promo swaps or things like that. Is that, is that, are those some things that you guys recommend? Yeah. And what you're touching on there is also just an interesting point that I've had to defend from the start 
but it speaks to your question, which is this idea that a musician's requirements are constantly evolving and changing over the course of a career. So when you're right at the start and you've just picked up your first baby guitar, all you really want is someone else who can sing and play guitar or write some lyrics to sit in the bedroom with you and write songs. That's step one. Let's say you do that for six months and you become okay and you decide you want to play in a 50 person bar, you know, in your local city that's, you know, you're going to need to speak to a promoter and then you're going to need to maybe speak to a merchandise person, maybe, and get your first CD print pressed. So then there's the, your, your, the number of people you need to deal with has just broadened again. Cut to a few years down the line and you're, you're playing, you know, a hundred or 200 person room, the number of people that are involved in that production grow again. And so your requirements are constantly evolving. And then even at those bigger stages, sometimes you go, you know what, I want to work with some new producers or I want to shake it up and work with some new session players. So you, these requirements never stop um, arriving and, and changing and it's very dynamic. And so that the whole purpose of Vampa is that as you get a new requirement or need, I call it a personnel requirement. It's not a very sexy word for it, but <laughs> um, it is what it is. As a new personnel requirement emerges in your career or musical life, uh, you can go back to your trusty companion Vampa and say, find me this person. And that's that's the whole sort of ethos behind it. I like that. Yeah, it's very true that what you need now is not what you're going to need in six months yeah. and and so on and so on. And so you can- And how good would it be to have a place that, like the well that you can keep going back to? And that was- That's right. That's what we designed it all for. Yeah, that makes sense. So I see you talk a bit about horizontal marketing for yes. musicians. What does that mean? I love talking about this because um, I've seen it happen uh, from people that are now considered, you know, the most famous in the music industry, but I knew them when they weren't. And it's this idea that sort of uh, a rising tide uh, lifts all boats. Mm, and so I'm all about often, that. Yeah. And so often what happens when a new musician comes along, let's say they're 17 or 18 and they want to be a star. That's great. But often what happens is they hit all of these platforms like Vampa, like SoundCloud, and they look for the most famous person in the room. And that's called vertical networking. The problem is, is that even if they manage, first and foremost, it's hard to get in touch with the famous person. But even if you do, the famous person doesn't owe you anything and there's no incentive for them to help you because you can't really provide any value to them. Um, and so you end up getting rejected and you become bitter. And that's why there's a lot of bitter musicians in the world because... <laughs> they feel like the world turned its back on them the reality is is that they didn't spend enough time investing in the people around them see winners in life are generally people that just keep showing up persistence is the most powerful key to success um, if you just by sheer virtue of turning up every day putting in the hours sticking with your passion you will eventually make it by some definition of the word make it uh, and probably your own in internal definition of success will mature and evolve alongside that so when you do invest in the people around you and you take the care to build relationships with folks that are on the same level and you, you know, you help them when they need help, they help you and you need help. What tends to happen is one of you will probably get a little bit ahead, but that person won't sort of, you know, knock your hand back and say, no, I'm not helping you anymore because they remember that you were there for them. And then you'll probably get a little bit ahead and it's going to be a bit of tugging each other up basically and I, I've seen it happen in my career but I also I mean I, I, I worked at Kanye West studio for a while and what what blew me away when I worked there in Los Angeles where I live now when I first moved here and I got to work in that studio for a couple of years it was how many people were still there from his childhood days and then you know in the last couple of years I got to work with Tommy Brown who's probably the biggest producer in the world right now he did Ariana Grande's last several records he didn't do her records because she was famous and he was famous. They actually both grew up in the same neighborhood and they started working together before neither of them were famous. This is horizontal networking. And I, I love those examples because we're talking about superstars, but I'm telling you, they didn't become superstars because some other superstar pulled them up. They actually rose together. And this is what sometimes, you know, younger artists come to Vampa or they'll go on our Instagram and go, where are the famous people on here? You don't get it. You, you, that's not the point. <laughs> what <laughs> You're missing the whole point. You become famous by meeting other people on here who are at your level, who, who need your help and you, they need your help and, and it becomes reciprocal and then together you excel. That's how, that's how success happens. People helping each other and collaborating. Oh, I so agree. And I see that in my own business. You know, the people that have come up with me over the past six years working in this space 
we've all helped each other. We've all grown together and all of our businesses have grown there you go. and, you know, they're still my go-to people and they, they know they can count on me and I know I can count on them. And, you know, I didn't come into the space and like immediately try to connect with someone that was like a superstar because that probably wasn't going to happen. I had to prove myself first. I had to, yes. you know, put in the hours, like you said. But no one likes to hear that. And it's, um, this is a, it's an education gap that exists in our industry. It's quite unique to music. Um, and I, I, it makes sense. It's, it's similar to what happens in Hollywood with actors as well, where there's an expectation that things should happen quickly. Um, but like any, any, um, any skill, you do have to prove yourself um, and you have to impress the people around you. And ultimately you've got to support each other. And at some point you will be the, the oldest guys in the room and, and, Again, just by virtue of turning up, if, if you're patient, you will eventually get to the destination. But no one wants to hear that for some reason. I, I, I can see why, because superstars are young. It's not uh, sexy, I know, but uh, it's, it's really how the world works in general. There's those crazy flukes, right? The people that- Justin Bieber. Yeah. But that's not normal. And, and that's, you can absolutely still make a bucket load of money and still find fame and everything as a later in life musician, Bonnie Ver is a great example, but there's many of them. But yeah, yeah, Justin Bieber is the exception, not the not the rule. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So are there any other you know, features <laughs> or things you'd like to highlight about Vamper that help musicians that we haven't covered yet? Yes, there's my favorite one, which we haven't touched on at all, which is um, a part, a division of our company that's relatively new called Vamper Publishing. Um, and it's, I think, the most exciting part of the business and so do my shareholders um, because of the potential. But uh, basically, th there's not a lot of, there's lots of non-exclusive sync agencies around the world. And for those listening who don't know what that is, a sync agency is responsible for taking their catalogue of songs that they represent, talking to music supervisors that work on films, TV, shows, video games, advertisements, looking for music to sync your song to the moving picture, and, you know, if you're watching a car commercial and there's a song in the background, that's a sync. So we wanted to launch a sync division, um, but we wanted to sort of do it a little bit differently than the way that lots of the non-exclusive sync agencies work. And so we saw one of the problems with um, submitting songs to sync companies is the burden of metadata and submissions and upload time and tagging and all of that. So we, we designed a sort of proprietary submission system that's very fast where you can just copy and paste a link to your song, whether it's from YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, wherever, um, into a form, inside the app, into a form in the app. And we ask you a few questions. Do you have 100% of the master rights? Yes. Do you have the publishing rights? Yes. Do you have any co-writers? Yes, no. Um, and then submit it and it goes off to our A&R team. We then have a group of people that listen to things um, and we come up with a short list and ultimately we have sync representatives around the world that are out there pitching the Vampa catalog. The great thing about our deal is that we don't own anything of yours. We don't take, we don't ask for any money. So some of our competitors ask for money, like song traders, quite expensive, for example, as an alternative. Um, and there's no guarantee that they'll get your placement. We don't ask for anything until we sync your song. And if we sync your song, uh, we have a very simple split, 35, 65 in favor of the artist, which is very generous. Most sync houses are 50, 50. And we take publishing uh, rights. We take the same split, sorry, and from the publishing rights for two years. Um, so there's never an upfront cost to the artist at all. Uh, we might change your life with the fantastic sync. Um, and then we collect on it for a couple of years and you get your rights back. Uh, so it's probably the most artist-friendly um, publishing deal slash program in the world um, designed by an artist, as you can tell, because I've signed so many publishing deals in my lifetime that I knew what I'd like one to look like that was fair. And so I, I put myself in the, the reverse, you know, in the other person's shoes effectively when we came up with this. But um, it, we're just getting started. But I will say in the first sort of 12 months, we now have had 50,000 songs submitted to us for like that we represent. Um, which is crazy. I don't know that any catalogs ever grown so fast. Um, and sifting through those 50,000 songs has not been an easy task. We have a whole army of interns who uh, spend all day listening. Um, but uh, it's great. And this year, the real focus is, is getting as many syncs as possible and, and really helping our, our users start to make money. And again, the thing I love about it is that they don't have to, like this isn't part of Vampa Pro. This isn't a premium feature. This is a feature that is available to anyone who's on the app that wants to have their songs repped. So how, how can that be a bad thing for anyone? 
No, that is amazing. And I, I love that you have the two year, the recension, like I, yeah. most people don't have that. And That's for me, me, that would make me feel a lot more secure. Like, oh, I can get my rights back in two years. If nothing we also happens. know, we also know, I know as an artist, um, but we also know just more generally looking at, at um, the trends in the music industry that when a song is synced to a major brand, like let's say we got an Apple commercial, for example, with one of our artists, that song is going to make a lot of money for the next couple of years. Um, so it's a good time to be publishing the track and, and taking a commission. And then it's going to start to slow down. When it starts to slow down, the revenue's lower for the for us, but also that's probably when the artist needs it the most. So mm -hmm. it's just fair, it's fair to give it back to the artist at that point. Right. So like, do you accept all the songs that are sent in or are you going through them and like, okay, we think we can sync this. We think we can sync this. Well, no, there's a process of we, when, when someone hits submit, when they go through the app. So I'll talk about the user experience first. They go through and answer those questions and then they get this confetti and it says, congratulations, you su submitted your song. Um, look out for an email from our A&R team. Should we have any further questions or follow-ups? Um, we don't promise them anything at that point. I can promise you that their song is listened to, um, but there is definitely a no pile. Um, so we, well, we have 50,000 songs that we can represent, but in terms of actively out there pitching and representing, it's probably closer to a thousand. Okay, you're, so you're not actually I, representing them. Like, so if you choose one and you really like it, you think it has potential, you let them know, like, we're going to represent this song. No, we don't. We don't let them know until there's an opportunity. Well, that's not strictly true. If there's a track that we know fits a certain brief, we might get in touch in advance to collect metadata that we're missing. Mm -hmm. um, that's quite a regular thing. But the, the 50,000 overall songs that we have, even though some of them have no's next to them because, you know, maybe the production quality is not good enough or, yeah, it's usually, in fact, it's almost 99% of the time if it's a no, it's because the production quality is enough yep. to sync standards. But we still have the ability to go back and reference them. So technically they are still under our representation. We're just not actively pushing those, those tracks in the no category. Yeah. Got it. And it is totally non-exclusive? Completely non-exclusive. Wow. The only, the, 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 bur the burden is on the artist though to let us know if they sign a publishing deal. And that's, um, we've never had an issue with it, but it's, you can see how that might be a problem. Yes. I can. Well, that's really amazing that you offer that to anyone, um, not needing to sign a contract or anything like that. So that is, I'm glad you highlighted that because that's definitely, I'm sure something you guys are going to be really pushing a lot in the future years. Yeah. When you sign up for the publishing program, you sign, you, you digitally sign a short form agreement that stipulates what will happen in the event that we land you a deal. Mm -hmm. So it, that it's, it's, it is non-exclusive and it says, in the event that we land you a deal, we bring you the opportunity, you approve the opportunity, then that's that kick starts the two year collection period. And that's it. You don't have to, yeah, there's no physical contract or anything like that. That's awesome. Very cool. Wow. Okay. So let's just talk real quick about the, the app itself. Is it is it on both Apple and Android? Yes. Yeah. 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 So okay. we started is there a desktop uh, version as well. Uh, there, the kind of um, it's in it's in the works. There is right now. If you go to vampa.me slash your handle from the app, you will see a desktop version of your profile, um, which is kind of a little. Uh, here's a hint for your listeners. It's a free. It acts as a free EPK electronic press kit because it collects all of your stuff and it presents it in a really elegant way. So you can check out mine. It's vampa.me slash Josh, um, and that's my profile, and it, it looks. It just looks really nice. That's probably what I would call the very early version of what Vampa for desktop will be. Um, but we started as a mobile first company at the time when we launched in 20 sort of 16 ish, when we actually came out with the product, uh, it was very trendy. Everything was very to be on mobile. Everything was about mobile first. Um, I would say that that wave has passed a little bit now. And, <laughs> and also we've grown, we've got over a million users now. So trying to grow past the mobile restriction. But yes, I mean, it's predominantly a mobile app. Wow, you have over a million users. Yeah. Man, what, what is kind of the, the demographics of like what, you know, around the world where people are from? Yeah, um, I mean, the biggest market is North America with about 30% of our market share there. Um, and then, I mean, Europe is up, Europe as a whole would be our second biggest market. But in terms of individual countries, Brazil, India, Mexico, uh, massive hundreds of thousands of people in those places and you know australia is not too bad either 
there. It's pretty spread out. I mean, we have active users in every single country on the planet. So it doesn't matter where you land on the, on if where you get off on a plane, sorry, you can open Vampire and find someone to jam with, um, which I think is very cool. Uh, and in terms of like, you know, demographics from an age perspective and stuff, it's sort of the biggest bracket is 16 to 24 by a long shot. That's by far our largest group. But then actually the next largest group is, is older than that. Um, so you got to 25 to 30, that's quite a, a big bracket. So it's definitely, there's more males than females on there, which is a problem, unfortunately, for the entire industry. Oh, um, we're going to work on that because that's yeah. one of my big platforms is, yeah. um, you know, more equity for women. And all. I mean, not, yeah. not that it's not equity, but like, I think just women tend to not get as much exposure in the industry as they could or feel like they are going to should put themselves out there as much as they as much as guys do i don't know what it is you know? i don't know what it is either and when we look at like for example we run ads from other music brands on the platform that's how we make you know monetize the 97 percent who aren't pro members mm -hmm. um but like just looking at how the women interact with the ads they're such great customers like they're so enthusiastic they want to try things like the, the engagement rate just in general, not I shouldn't even just speak about ads, just more holistically, the way that our female user base interacts with people in the app um, and tries the features and, and gets active in the discussion rooms. And it's so much more positive and fun to watch and, 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 and interact with than with some of the more sort of uh, chip on their shoulder dudes that um, <laughs> hang around. And I just I love that you say that as a dude. I, well, you know, I, maybe it's because I was raised by a single mom, but um, <laughs> but I just have so much appreciation for the for the female, you know, side of our user base um, because they bring so much uh, just warmth to the platform that otherwise wouldn't be there. Uh, and I wish it was bigger. And we we do go out of our way when when it, whether it comes to marketing materials or our socials um we always try and highlight the women's stories more because we're trying to attract more of that caliber um to the platform i think the problem is that they know that there's because so many of these music sites are so male heavy that it can be intimidating um and so we, we really try to create a the safest environment possible to do our best to change that but it, it, it's one company unfortunately alone is not going to change an industry-wide problem um, yeah no i mean but I, I i personally think i've seen it change a lot over the past 15 years that i've yeah. been doing this yeah. um the the balance has changed it's yes. still not there it, like you said it's still more 70 30 which yes. is frustrating to me but um but i i mean i think this particular platform is very interesting to women because of the relational aspect and so i hope people will listen to this or watch this and and jump in um especially my large female base because i do think that they will really feel at home there and there are there are some creeps that do you know come out of the woodwork from time to time of vampire and we have a zero tolerance policy just to be clear and reassure folks so you know if, if some girl gets harassed by a guy and you know people can't send like unsolicited pictures or anything like that but if even if someone just says you know hey good looking want to hook up or whatever if someone lets us know that that's well first of all you can press report and we will then see what's been said and if it's mm. if we to be harassment we have a zero tolerance policy and they're gone but more importantly if a, if a person doesn't even need to be a female if a person reaches out to us and says someone was inappropriate and we had a, a case the other day when someone said in a session so it wasn't even on the app but they'd met someone on the app they then went to a session and he touched her bum like now obviously we're not the police and we can't do anything about the physical side of it but we sure as hell made sure that he was never coming back to a vampire ever again and you know we'd work with her and whatever help she needed to you know, to make sure it didn't, she felt safe again, basically. And so that, that's our attitude and, and philosophy towards that is we, we, we are very proud to be, to have that zero tolerance policy because we don't want people to have that cynicism or skepticism that Vampa might be a place where they could be taken advantage of. Yeah. Yeah. You, you would probably have to put that in place for sure for yeah. a social app like this. So I'm really glad that you guys have that. And it's going to make our listeners feel uh, very comfortable to jump over there. So why don't you let them know like the best way that they can get on the platform and um, to anything that they need to know to get started? Yep. So you can uh, head to vampa.me. So that is V-A-M-P-R dot M-E. 
uh, and there'll be links to download the app from either the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store right at the top. Sign up. It's free. It's fun. If nothing else, you might make some friends, but hopefully you'll make some money and, and actually it'll help with you, help you with your career and, and, and help you achieve whatever your current blocker or next step might be. Get past that and, um, and excel. Awesome. Well, I'm definitely going to go check it out. I can't believe I'm not on this app yet. So I'm definitely <laughs> going to go check it out uh, later today. But awesome. thank you so much, Josh. This has been really informative. And I know that musicians are going to really use this information and hopefully jump in and, and get networking. Cool. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. 